Hello, everybody. Welcome to CMC. I'm Kermit Whitfield, a member of CMC's board and uh, AVP of Communications at United Way of Central Ohio. Great to see everyone here today. I want to do a quick poll. How many folks are here from out of town? Can you just raise your hands? Oh, my goodness. This has got to be some kind of record. Thank you so much for making the uh, drive to here today. I think uh, you're going to be uh, find that this uh, forum is well worth your time and well worth the drive. Today, the Columbus Metro Club, Metropolitan Club presents Alice, a study of financial hardship. And this is the Ohio premiere of this. Alice stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and Employed. It is a way of defining and understanding how families, neighbors, and colleagues who work hard and earn above the federal poverty level do not have enough to afford a basic household budget to include housing, childcare, food, transportation, and health care, really the basics. In particular today, we will learn how this new National United Way initiative relates to us in Ohio. Won't you please help me welcome Deputy Mayor and Chief of Staff for the City of Akron, James Hardy, Director of Energy Assistance Programs, Community Action Partnership of Greater Dayton, Joel Thomas-Jones, President and CEO of Ohio United Way, Stephen C. Holland, and our host, journalist for Ohio Public Radio, Joe Inglis. Joe, take it away. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this important subject uh, discussion today. I got to tell you that early in my career, um, there was a lot of talk about welfare reform and the contract with America and how things were going to change. And through the years, things have changed. Um, the main cha change is people are working. In some cases, they're working two or three jobs, and they're barely making ends meet in many cases. So that's why we're here today. Um, even if folks can make ends meet, they lack the ability to save for the future and that affects everyone. The manufacturing jobs that were once prominent in Ohio that pay good pay and benefits are gone, and uh, they're being replaced with jobs that just don't pay as much and don't offer the benefits. So to talk about that, um, we're going to uh, ask Steve, first of all, uh, to talk about the findings of this new report. It says 40% of Ohio's households struggle to meet basic needs, 40%. We're not talking savings there. And those, those people are known as Alice's, uh, as far as this report is concerned. And the United Way is trying to come up with ways to deal with this population. So Steve, let me ask you, what are you doing with this? Well, the Alice report uh, was first done by the United Way of Northern New Jersey uh, just a few years back. 2012, I believe, was the year that they uh, first compiled an Alice report uh, looking at the populations in, in their area. Uh, since that time, uh, they've uh, taken this product and taken it to other states, and we are now the 15th state uh, that has uh, undergone this Alice uh, review. And the, the Alice review looks at uh, the, the five factors that Kermit mentioned earlier, uh, food, uh, transportation, uh, housing, and then child care and health care is the five basic components uh, to uh, put together a survival budget. This is a budget above the poverty line, but it is a survival budget. There's also another category that talks about a, uh, a stability budget. Uh, that includes other factors, such as a cell phone, uh, such as uh, paying taxes, uh, such as miscellaneous expenditures. So we're just talking about the basics in this Alice population. Uh, the, the state of Ohio has a 14% poverty level. The Alice population is the next 26% up. Uh, on a statewide average. So it's up to 40%, two out of every five households. You'll see some new stories today uh, as to the funding of this report. It is based upon households, not on individuals. And uh, this, is, this is the population that uh, is asset limited and they are employed, uh, but they're having a difficult time making ends meet. Mm -hmm. 
So let me ask you, James, Dayton, a city that once housed major manufacturing jobs, NCR and um, General Motors, Mead Vapor, uh, there were some big ones there. Um, those jobs are not there in the number they used to be, and according to this report, you have a lot of Alice's in your community. What does that mean? So, in, 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 can say in, in the Dayton area, you talk about Dayton, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So what that means, and, and in the capacity that I uh, work now as Director of Energy Assistance and Community Action Partnership, it means that we see a lot more Alice families. More importantly, oh. though, is that poverty has taken on a new perspective, a new look. Um, it doesn't look and feel the same. So when we talk about struggling families, at least I have an image, maybe homeless, uh, shabby housing. But what we're finding specifically uh, in my job, and especially in Dayton, is that Alice live right next door to you. They are at the football games on Friday. They are walking their dogs. Alice families look like everyone else, but they are the invisible. So what are we doing in Dayton? Everything that we possibly can to ensure and make sure that these families are plugged in and connected. Mm -hmm. um, which is difficult because uh, sometimes Alice families don't consider themselves to be those who uh, would take part in social services, uh, take part in energy assistance. And at there are times, as a director, I meet families who are appalled that they even have to come in. And so, again, we're looking at poverty, we're talking about poverty, but poverty's taking on a different look. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know the problems that we have here in Dayton. Mm -hmm. Dayton is on the rebound, it is, uh, with lots and lots of jobs. But again, we have to look at what are the impact of those jobs, how are they weighted, are, um, people in the community uh, able to make ends meet with those positions. And often in times they're not. And that's where the social services agencies mm -hmm. pick up at. James, you work with um, this population in your city. Um, how does that play out from the standpoint of being someone in charge of a city and the services and, and everything working together as a community? Sure. So I would ditto everything that Joelle said. <clears throat> I and, and add that I think that national trends tend to manifest themselves in cities. And right now, it's my own belief, cities are really the laboratories of democracy. We are the ones that are facing head on challenges that in many ways are created by policy making outside of our control. And I would actually say counties as well. And so for city policy makers, um, one of the reasons why we were so enthusiastically supportive in Akron of the Alice uh, report is that we've never mapped this population before. We always known they were there. Um, we know those that are living below the federal poverty line. We have structures in place. Uh, we can, and we do often, argue how effective they are. But we have structures in place. But what happens if you make just enough that you don't qualify for that? And all of the reasons that Joelle talked about in terms of you've never had to ask for assistance before. You wouldn't even know necessarily how to go about doing that. We don't have a lot of structures in place. So from a city leadership perspective, this is really one of the greatest challenges Ohio cities are going to have to face, which is what are the impacts at a city level of income inequality? So the, the inability, you're employed, but the inability to make enough to be able to live and support your family at the same time. How are we going to deal with that? And so uh, one of the ways that we have um, and are going to be addressing it in Akron is we formed an, uh, a hard link with our United Way, who is also aligned, obviously, along these, these routes. And so we are going to be putting, in some cases, brick and mortar resources into neighborhoods who, quite frankly, have never seen it before. These are working class neighborhoods who used to work in the rubber factories or the grandparents did, and you're the grandson or granddaughter of a rubber worker who is now working three jobs and just to make enough in terms of real dollars as what your grandparent did or your parent did. And they've never had to deal with this level of, of instability. And so we're going into the neighborhoods and we're going we're gonna to try and meet it head on. 
Well, that brings us to another question, which is housing. There just really isn't, if you look at every single report I've seen in the last three years, there isn't enough affordable housing to meet the need in, in basically every part of the state. So how do you go about dealing with that? That's a pretty big problem, right, Steve? Housing is a big problem. Um, the, uh, the, the, it, so folks have to put their household budgets together, and they certainly have to have uh, a, a place to stay. A, a single person, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit easier. Uh, a family of four, as the Alice study is uh, put together, uh, we, we show a family of four being a husband and a wife, or uh, two partners, uh, a preschool child, and, and, and a toddler or an infant. Uh, and finding affordable housing that is quality housing as well is is is, is an issue for um, a number of folks who are in the in the Alice uh, community. Uh, my wife is a housing coordinator in southwestern Ohio, and uh, every night she comes home with stories about uh, uh, the the inability to to find places for people to stay where they meet the qualifications. And the, uh, it, so, as as has been pointed out earlier, it's just sometimes above that poverty threshold that folks are finding it difficult to to find that place where they can reside. Is there a push to put more housing in communities, Joel? There is a push, but you know, I, Steve said something really interesting. So I live in Dayton, okay? And one of the things I can always say, you know, you, you go to college, you leave your city, and then somehow you end up back where you started, right? But one of the things that I used to say, and I, I wanna be very clear about this, I used to say, Dayton is a place where you can buy a house and still go on vacation and not worry about it. And that's something that I and friends, we used to brag about. You can buy a house and go on vacation and be a little flippant with your money. That is inc readily, increasingly becoming unrealistic. Uh, and progress, in, uh, this is not to say that progress isn't good and that we shouldn't have uh, premium housing because we absolutely should. But where I live at, less than a tenth of a mile they put up half a million dollar condos. Who are these mass men? Where, where, <laughs> we, I, I, I thought I'd, I had to stop and look. Did that say four ninety nine? More importantly, someone lives there. So in my neighborhood, there are no f half a million dollar houses at all. But what has happened in the, in the terms of progress, downtown was growing, which is absolutely beautiful, right? But pretty soon, those houses where I live at, in the neighborhood where my friends live at, if our incomes don't change, we will not be able to afford to live where I am living presently right now. That is a travesty. In the interest of progress, it has to be balanced. And that is something that I don't see. I'm not sure it's just in Dayton, but I'm sure it's nationwide, maybe in Akron and Columbus. Uh, people who have been there from the beginning, who have stayed with the cities in the housing crisis, uh, who didn't leave, uh, now so are in conversations are afraid. What does this mean for me? So yes, uh, there are some, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, we're not talking about uh, hood housing either. We're talking about creating neighborhoods that working families can live, grow, and leave a legacy of wealth for their families. That is not happening. Right. James, what about those neighborhoods, you, the communities you were talking about? Sure. Do they have affordable housing and enough of it? Yes, yeah, so in Akron, we're too affordable. That's our issue. And um, uh, we are not unlike a lot of Ohio cities um, outside of the big three, maybe, but I think even the big three are dealing with it as well. We've prioritized housing as an administration. Uh, my mayor uh, set out, and we brought in the reinvestment fund nationally and then the Greater Ohio Policy Council locally to look at our housing stock and our housing challenges and, and recommend some, some next steps. Um, this is, again, one of those key challenges in how we, we face this because Alice, the first two letters of that acronym are asset limited. Believe it or not, the reinvestment fund found that while we have about 48% of people in Akron who are renting, that means we still have a high rate of, of home ownership. And in fact, even in our hardest hit communities, we have 
no uh, rate lower than 30% home ownership. So in, there are people who own their home and it's worth nothing. And so what we're trying to do is invest back into neighborhood housing. We tear down 250 to 300 homes a year since, um, uh, since the foreclosure crisis. We can't keep that clip and still have a neighborhood after a while. So what are we doing with these vacant lots? We can't mow them forever. There needs to be new construction. There needs to be construction that's affordable but also attractive to bring people back from the suburbs. No offense to the suburbs, we want people coming back to the cities. But how do you balance all that, as Joel said, because one of the most interesting things from a city policymaking perspective is what's the first thing people say when something's going wrong in a neighborhood? It's impacting my, how, my home value. My home value is going down, and that's important because that's their single, for most people, their single biggest asset, especially for Alice. And what happens when we start to improve the neighborhood? Home values come up and people say, I can't pay those taxes. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is a challenge I don't have a good answer for yet, but I can tell you that um, true gentrification right now, at least in Akron, is a far, far, far away issue. We are too affordable, and the problem is, is that people who own their homes, who are Alice, aren't getting what they need out of that, that asset. And those that are thinking about, hmm, I kind of want to move back into the city, aren't seeing a reason to make an investment into the neighborhood. So we got to rise, you know, all ships. But to Joel's point, I'd be lying if I said I had a good answer for how we're going to do it so that everybody truly benefits. You know, one of the things that kind of struck me when I was looking through the report is you're talking about basic needs. Now, when I think of basic needs, I also think of a little bit of savings being in there because to me that's kind of a basic need if something happens in the house. But that wasn't even, um, that's not even considered a basic need in the, in the terms of this report. So tell me, that has to be huge in terms of how people live, right? In, in, in the survival budget portion of the report, that's correct. Uh, savings is not included as a factor in that, and that's why I mentioned earlier, if you go to the next level up, a household stability budget, then savings is included in that. But that's, that's above the Alice level. That's not the Alice level. That 26 percent and 14 percent poverty level, those 40 percent savings is, is not a factor in there. there, there and this goes to uh, the point about assets being limited, um, a couple of I know we try to stay away from statistics, but sometimes they can be uh, enlightening And that, according to the Federal Reserve in 2015, 47 percent of the households could not cover an emergency expense of $400. 47 percent could not cover it. And then 24 percent of Ohio households uh, do not have enough net worth to subsist at the poverty level for three months. So there, it is, it's, when you say asset limited, it is asset limited. There is, and then so they work two jobs, they work three jobs in a household, and they are surviving, but they are not moving up the, the, the socioeconomic ladder. Uh, they are not uh, getting into middle class or, or, or higher at, with these positions. It's not enough to save. Uh, for, for education or for any number of uh, emergencies or, or for an emergency that might come along. Can I just add to that? Um, it's very interesting, uh, part of being part of, so we get together, we're doing this research for the Alice Project, and we get to Columbus and uh, we're going over the findings. And I just gotta share this. So we're sitting in this big, luxury, luxurious law firm, and, and I'm there, I'm like, okay, so the work is gonna, you know, we're gonna talk about the work. And he starts to, they, the lady starts to talk about the numbers. And they were terrifying because at that particular point, I was Alice. And so a couple months after that, a few weeks after that, um, my company was sold by, to another company in DC and I was laid off. So for nine and a half months, I looked for a job every savings that I had, my 401k that I had, all of it was spent. So, you know, we weren't at the exact the poverty, poverty level, but at the end of nine and a half months of, of an exhaustive job search, I was depleted. Nothing. Everything that I had worked for, all those times for my two sons, for my family, um, was gone. 
So when you look at this report, you know, with the right education, you do the right things, you know, went and studied overseas, did all, didn't get in jail, did nothing. No crazy pictures of me anywhere, right? <laughs> and as much as I worked, I met this criteria. So I understand when I have my clients come in, when they say to me, when I say the DPNL or the, the electric company says, you have a $400 default before we can put you on an energy assistance plan. And I say, my staff might say, well, how much of that can you pay? We say $400, nothing. I can't pay $1 of the $400, and that's where we come in with emergency services. That is a very real reality. And at a time when I didn't see myself as an Alice person, again, because I did everything right, right? I am an Alice person, with barely able to put money aside for my savings. So I don't know how I make up 20 years in three months or in another 10 years at my age. So we're talking about some, you know, we, we know this, but we're talking about some serious stuff and we're talking about legacy for my children or your children and assets. And we work so that our children don't have to start over again from ground zero. And that's what seems to be happening a lot. Yeah. That's frightening. That's and it's terrifying. gotta be frightening yeah. at, yeah. The, at the state and the city level, right, James? It is. And, um, Thank you for sharing that. I think that's powerful. And, and two things that I would um, expand upon in terms of my experience working through the research team with this. First is child care. Um, seems like, which is good, but it seems like around the state, early childhood education has really been prioritized in Amer many of our cities. A lot of our mayors have even gone out and, and raised funds from city funds to support early childhood. But what does it say that you need to spend, just for a survival budget, $1,400 a month to be able to go to work? We've, no matter how good a quality of early childhood education, if you can't afford it, you're not going to go. And so that really challenged me. The second piece is transportation. And I promised I wouldn't get like on a soapbox, so I won't. But, one of the things we're looking at very strategically in Northeast Ohio are the geography of jobs. And we talked about it a little bit as a group before we came up here. You know, politically speaking, when you're a mayor, you just need to get the jobs. As long as you're ticking up the clock, you know, the scoreboard with jobs, you're seen as successful. That's the narrative. But, but as Joelle said earlier, we don't wait the jobs. We don't look to see if those jobs necessarily pay a living wage anymore. One thing we don't look at at all, or we, sh we are starting to look at more, is the geography of the jobs. Public transportation is in a serious crisis point in, in the state of Ohio. It needs to be said. And it's at a crisis point because it's hard to get to the jobs. Um, jobs don't always locate in city centers anymore. You can't walk to them. Um, our public transportation budget in, in counties is, is um, in some cases overly spent, in other cases woefully underfunded. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And so um, to give you a personal um, experience with it, we are, our, our bus service in Summit County was going through a rate, uh, a, excuse me, a um, route consolidation project. And I got called by a gentleman named Moses who takes the bus from Akron, he starts out at 5, 5.30 a.m. He has a family, so his wife also works, so how they get the kids where they need to go, I don't know. But it takes him two hours to get to Richfield for the job. Two hours to it and two hours back. And we're talking a difference of maybe 10 miles. But he doesn't have the assets, so he doesn't have the car. He's relying on the public transit, and he's working a full shift every day. And all he wanted was for that route, which was up for, for elimination, to not be eliminated because it would then take him three hours to get to the job. We've got to start thinking about where jobs are located, what the types of jobs are, and also what you need to get the job. Because it can't just be that economic development is how many jobs do we bring in today. 
If I could follow up on that as well. So, one of my duties as, as, as the new president of the Ohio United Way is to, is to go around the state meeting with local United Way leaders. There are 70 United Ways in the state of Ohio. No state has more local United Ways than we do except for the state of Texas. And so I'm going out and visiting these local United Ways. And, and while the problem exists in terms of volume at, 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 in, in the major cities of the state, the problem exists at a higher rate in many of our smaller counties. Uh, southeastern Ohio, in particular, has uh, a, a poverty analysis rate. In, the poverty analysis rate of 11 counties in the state are at 50 percent or greater. Statewide average, again, is 40. Their rate is 50 percent or greater. Nine of them are in southeastern Ohio. Transportation to and from jobs is a problem. I was visiting a uh, the, uh, local United Way really not that far from here. Uh, uh, last week or the week before, and the director of that United Way said to me that her goal was to figure out how to get housing built near some of the big box stores and uh, fast food restaurants that employ many of the Alice people because they don't have a means of getting to and from those uh, uh, jobs. Uh, and transportation, while it is difficult in the cities, it's really difficult if you're living in, in, in r the rural counties of our state, uh, trying to get from you know, 15 miles away, 20 miles away to a job uh, can be a, a, a daunting task and, in fact, an impossible task at times even to get to employment. Yeah, and you can't take an Uber and it's yeah. too far to walk and so there aren't many um, possibilities there, right? There, there, there's some folks uh, uh, with United Way support, some corporations that are trying to uh, develop ways of, uh, of, of getting folks to these positions, following up in an Uber style, uh, but they're in the startup stage. They're, they're, they're early in, the, in their, uh, their operations, and so far uh, that is still continues to be a problem in the state. We're hearing a lot right now, starting to hear more about this tax reform plan that's coming out on the national level. Um, it's, you know, the tax rates here in the state have been dropping since about 2004. And um, we've seen, you know, these tax, the tax cuts, we've seen how they affect communities. And right now we're talking about this, this problem economically. Are we going the right direction as far as tax cuts are concerned? or? Is there a different way or a different approach that you need, you think needs to be handled? I'll let you take that one. Uh, Whoever <laughs> wants it. I'm, I'm happy to jump into those waters. James, it's yours. Um, so it's not going to come as a shock. No, I don't think we're going in the right direction in terms of our tax policy. Um, um, it's, it's well documented, so I won't go uh, into details, but obviously the cuts to local uh, local communities at the state and national level has been devastating. Akron has a quarter percent income tax increase for basic city services on the ballot this November. If it doesn't pass, we're not going to do things, certain things anymore that the city, that people rely on because we don't, we can't afford it. Um, it's the first time we've had a basic city services levy on since 1981. So I think we've been pretty darn good stewards of our resources, but we're at that point. And actually we're trying to play catch up to Dayton, to Cleveland, um, to Columbus and others that have already gone to two and a half percent to try and make up the difference. So um, I said in the beginning, national, state and national trends tend to manifest themselves in cities. Tax policy is no different. Um, I haven't really bothered to read in depth the federal proposals because I don't have a lot of faith they're going to remain the way they are right now. Um, but CDBG, uh, Community Development Block Grant Funds, which President Nixon started, so this is not a crazy liberal idea has been whittled away to the extent of almost nothingness. And CDBG funds are how cities and communities, and you're right, Steve, I don't want to uh, only talk about the big eight, we, you know, rural Ohio relies on these funds as well. That's the bread and butter for neighborhood building. I mean, that's what we used to use to fix, make the public improvements, put in the roadways, make sure that people had sidewalks to walk to work. The city of Akron's allocation is the lowest this year in 15 years, and that's Republican and Democratic administrations. So when you look at tax policy at the federal and state level, we are 
we are continuing, unfortunately, in my opinion, a trend of disinvestment in local communities. And so local communities more and more, and then Alice more and more have to rely on themselves to survive. And so cities and communities have their own survival budgets now as a, relate, as, as a, as a result of tax policy, just like Alice. The, the reason I turn to James to, to, to answer that question, obviously he deals in uh, these types of policy issues at, at the, the city level, and they have to deal with putting items on the ballot. I want to make clear that Ohio United Way, representing the United Ways of the state, we, we want to be very cautious about advocating for or against any particular public policy. Uh, our main goal, uh, besides uh, raising uh, dollars for local agencies uh, in terms of public policy, is to draw awareness to these issues. That's, that's the significance of the Alice Report. Uh, we see ourselves as being conveners going forward, uh, where we can draw people together at a place like this, at your, you know, in Dayton, in, in, in Akron, and in, 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 in small counties around the state to uh, have that discussion of public officials and social service agencies and drawing people together to discuss what are the difficulties. We have now a document in Alice, and this, this piece that you have at your table is really significant in that regard because it gives you a snapshot of, of, of what's going on there uh, in the Alice report. But we now have a common nomenclature, terminologies, statistics, uh, a, a way of measuring that is consistent, uh, well, not only w from county to county or political subdivision within a county across the state, but from state to state. Now we can compare ourselves to Indiana. Now we can com compare ourselves to Michigan, neighboring states, and see how we stack up against them. I haven't done that analysis, but we can, we, but we can do that. And that's so often an organization would issue a report based upon housing or an organization would issue a report based upon food. Uh, this, is, this is a report that draws all those together from all those appropriate sources and, and, and starts comparing apples to apples uh, instead of apples to something else. I just wanted to um, comment on that shortly. So I'm not a tax policy expert at all, but what I can see is the impact that those policies have on the community. So in regard to that, what I think we have to do as a community, as a state, as a whole, is we have to define what kind of community we want to create. And what does that look like? And what does that look like for the person who works the $10 an hour job to the person who works the $75 an hour job? And can we work together to create harmony and balance so people can live, maybe if they're not even living equally, they can live to the point of what's comfortable for them? How do we, with those policies, with tax reform, what kind of community are we creating and what do we want that to look like? Um, now, I think we're at a critical juncture here in the state and the nation where people like ourselves can help to influence those policies. And like Steve said, the awareness to have a name, uh, to have statistics so that people can begin to have these conversations as we move to set policies is what really is important. Mm -hmm. If I could just add one more thing to that, I, I, um, I'm glad you said that, Steve, because I think that, believe it or not, I know it sounds naive, but I'm hoping that Alice, by doing what United Way has done, which is really mapping this population, providing data that's comparable, creating a common, um, as you said, nomenclature, that we can start to work between cities, between states, between communities, that we can make this as nonpartisan an issue as possible. Let's just get at this. We don't have to necessarily, we'll, we'll argue, I'm sure, um, in the halls of power over, over maybe this idea or maybe that idea, but as long as we're over arguing we're doing something, you know, we've made progress. And so, again, I, I agree. I, I really applaud, from a city perspective, United Way's role in convening and just getting this report out there and participating as a state because now we can maybe uh, pull it out of the political uh, sphere a little bit and just talk in plain speak about what's really going on and what are the facts on the ground. Okay, well in a moment we're going to move to the audience questions. So uh, the microphone is over there. Don't be shy. Step up and ask your question um, in a few minutes. But let me throw out one final kind of scary question, I think. We see our population is aging. It's getting older and older. And if we have a lot of people who have very little to no savings 
and then all of a sudden they're, they're older, they're not working, and the people who are working aren't making enough to really contribute financially, that's a very scary place for our future, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, yes. It, what, what, what do you, I mean, what do you do? What do you, what, what, how do you handle that? You know, I will say so. I, I don't know exactly what we do. I know that this is a time for innovation and a time for critical thinking. But I will say this. I pray that I can live as comfortable as my mother does now 20 years from now. Um, who's retired, retired psychologist. And I, I, I share a little story real quick. I share with her at the, at the table. My mom was a full-time nurse, and she left uh, nursing to, become, to get her doctors in, in psychology. And so, you know, we weren't rich, but we lived okay. And um, I remember one day coming home from school, and I t flipped a light switch on. And didn't come on. We lived in the country, in a rural country, right? So I was like, well, we didn't have a storm. So I call my grandmother, who calls, this is before cell phone, call my grandmother, who calls my mother, my mother calls home, and I said, there's something wrong, terribly wrong. She said, what is it? I said, the lights won't come on. She said, they're not coming on. Well, what do you mean? I didn't pay the bill. What do you mean you didn't pay the bill? That was my first reality of not having enough. But today, because of the safety nets, nets that were put in place 30 years ago because of Social Security, because of her retirement. She's retired now and she lives very comfortably. And this is terrifying that in 20, 25 years, at this rate, I don't know if I can live as comfortable as my mother. And I think you touched on a good point, Joe. I don't know what the answer is to that. Maybe these two wise guys have it, but um, you know, that is something that we have to begin to deal with, definitely. So wise guys, do you have the answer? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, unfortunately, um, except to say that um, my fear um, uh, from the perspective I have and the position I have right now is that we won't be able to handle that transition. Uh, there just won't be enough resources available. Um, and, and I don't think any of us want to go back to a time where, you know, uh, retirement meant poverty automatically. and so. I don't have any good solutions. I know that the aging population is a concern for any policymaker at any level in the state right now. Um, there just aren't any silver bullet solutions out there at the moment. Steve, you have anything no, to I, add? I, I, okay. They've said it. Well, it is the Columbus Metropolitan Club's tradition to take audience questions. So when you step up to the mic here, I'm going to ask you to please state your name and ask your questions. And in consideration to everyone, please stick to your questions rather than editorial comments. So um, let's go to the first question, please. I'm Chris Close with ChangeWorks. And I think you made the point that Alice has been invisible. Uh, Joelle's story makes is, is very poignant in terms of making the point that we uh, we don't know who we're looking at. Over the years, it seems to me, public policy is differentiated between people who are in poverty or then 20% of poverty or 30%. Our, our language about who's in poverty has been complicated by public policy in terms of naming who's who needs to be served. I worry when I hear what you're talking about, that Alice and poor people may find themselves in competition for limited human services resources. And I wonder if you could talk about how we might rethink that continuum from poverty to Alice and how public policy might connect people instead of differentiate people. So, okay. So, okay. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. So the guys give it to the woman, I'll handle this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think what, what you said was powerful. Um, and, and, and specifically in my work, my line of work now, uh, in energy assistance. So people come in and do you meet the 125% poverty rate? Or do you meet the 150% poverty rate? If it's changed for a while, then we can help you. And if you don't meet those qualifications, then we have a limited amount of emergency services contingent upon your hardship that we might be able to assist you. 
And you're absolutely right. It begins to, we begin to look at poverty from percentages. And if you don't meet that percentage, if you don't, you're not living at that percentage, and you're just above it, then you have to go somewhere else. And the churches are depleted, guys. The churches, they call me and say, look, don't send anyone else over here. We can pray for them, but we can't give them any more money. And so, you know, I, I think that is, I wish I had the answer for that. But really, and that's exactly what's happened. The traditional person that we think about when we talk about poor is competing with those invisible families. And there's only so many resources. Every single day today while I'm here, my staff, as many people as we see, maybe 100 a day, that's three times the amount of people that we can't see. Three times the amount. I get phone calls every day. I've been calling this hotline for days or for weeks or for months, and I can't get in. And you said, do you work? But I can only come uh, at 3 o'clock because I work to 2 o'clock. So these are working families. You're absolutely right. They're competing for limited resources. Um, and that's something that we have to hold our legislators accountable for. But together as a community, we have to come together and find some solutions. Because what you said, Joe, the ulterior is, is frightening. The, the thing I, I would add is I, I, I don't know that they're necessarily in competition with each other, as the question was framed. Um, I do think that, um, I, again, the, 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 the strongest word in, in Alice for me is the last word, employed. And these are folks who work, they want to work, they believe in the American work ethic, um, they, they work multiple jobs, yeah. and they feel perhaps like it's not to their benefit to do that. Uh, and that's the part that concerns me long term. If they just feel like they're, they've got their fingers in the wall and they're just slowly sliding down the wall and they're working uh, two, three jobs. Um, that said, there are people in that 14% poverty level who are employed. Uh, just, just because you're in, in that 14% doesn't mean you're unemployed. Our unemployment rate is 4% uh, in the state. So there's 10% there's above that. Uh, so that's, that's something else to, to consider. And the only other thing I would add very quickly is that um, I would agree that I, I think it's incumbent upon us as policymakers not to um, create the same systems for Alice that we necessarily have already created for generational poverty. The, their needs are different. And so it's really, we have to think that through. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question, please. Hi, Alyssa Schneider with Mid-Ohio Food Bank. And we're um, at the Food Bank honored to serve, uh, gosh, hundreds of thousands of Alice families. And I'm always surprised by their resilience and I find them extremely inspiring in our work. And I'm curious, when you think about your experience with Alice families, what brings you the most hope? Oh, well, I can say what brings me the most hope is that, uh, just like the 14%, but these are working people and they don't give up. Yeah. Uh, they keep working and, and you mentioned two and three jobs and we go, oh, that's admirable, right? You have two or three jobs and that's great. But well, what are the repercussions for those children who have parents who have two and three jobs, mm -hmm. right? So uh, working in school before, uh, we tend to say the parents are absent and there's no parent involvement. Well, the parents are working at Walmart, the parents are working at Burger King, the parents are working home health aid. Um, but they keep working. And I really, and this is like a pie in the sky thing, but they still believe in the American dream, that if you just keep at it, just keep at it, that one day there's gonna be a breakthrough and you're gonna be able to exhale just a little bit. Uh, that's what gives me most hope. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that we're all right about that. Wow, that was really well said. Anyone have anything to add to that? Okay, okay. Uh, next question. Mark Valillo with Health Action Council. Uh, Steve, you just mentioned this a minute ago about 
employed is the last word and one of the most important words. We're a member organization of employers throughout the state of Ohio and 14 other states. My question is, is this is fresh off the press, obviously, but has there been discussion on involving employers in addressing these issues? Are there plans in the future for that? Well, in, we're, the, the number of hands that went up around the room as we began our conversation uh, represent a lot of the United Ways of the state that have come here for this. And we're going to be having a meeting uh, as soon as this meeting is through. Uh, and one of the things we're going to be discussing is next steps and how we go about getting this word out. I can tell you that uh, we are sharing the report uh, with all members of the, the Ohio General Assembly, all statewide elected officials. It's our goal to get it to uh, not necessarily, ne necessarily every county commissioner, but the board of county commissioners in every county uh, and probably some of the larger cities as well, although I believe a number of our local United Ways will be great at doing that. Uh, so our, our job is to get this message out first, then figure out those next steps of drawing the appropriate folks together, not just policymakers, like you mentioned, uh, uh, the employers uh, need to be uh, listening and part of the con listening and being part of the conversation as well. Thank you. Okay. The next question. Yes. Hi, uh, Andy Campbell. Um, so in the big picture, we elect our representatives to represent the people, to make policy. And it seems to me both at the state level and the federal level, when they get up there, we hear about cutting taxes and women's health issues and where or you, can't, you can or can't take your, your weapons. What are the things they should be focused on and how can we get them to pay attention to the work of the people? Wow, that's okay. a big one. Who wants that one? All right, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so the first thing, my response is, you know, and I know I'm biased, but, you know, Tip O'Neill is right. All politics is local. So pay more attention to the people you're electing to city council and mayors and, thing, and county commissioners because, you know, we can make a, a, a good bit of impact. So I, I have no answer for how to fix the, the, the sort of the, the perceived or real lack of movement from a policy perspective at, uh, on these major issues at a state and national level. Except to say, and, and, and hopefully this won't surprise too many people, but I think we've actually done better in Ohio at a state level, even I know I just criticized the tax policy, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll sandwich it by saying that things like Medicaid expansion, which I know is controversial, but actually came up as we were discussing the data, um, actually had a demonstrable impact on that survival budget. And so um, there are things that we can do, and when we do come together and tackle um, a big issue, uh, we can actually numerically show a change. Um, I think that your question was really what should they be focused on? So from, from, from a city's perspective, um, <clears throat> I already talked about transportation, but I can't underline that enough. We do not, we do not, we do not invest in public transportation, and it's, and it's killing us economically. Forget about whether or not you think public transportation is a good or a bad thing or whether you'd ever ride the bus. Mm -hmm. It's killing us economically. Um, the, the second piece I think we should, we should be looking at is fixing some of, the, uh, some of those um, systems, again, that allowed for decision making at the, at the level closest to those that are involved. Um, it used to be, as I said, that states were considered the laboratories of democracy because they could, they could, they were closer to the people, they could get waivers from the federal government to do innovative programming around Medicare, Medicaid, um, social services, et cetera. Unfortunately, I feel like we've gone away from that. So now cities are leading in a lot of those things. All the more reason to look at CDBG and maybe CDBG isn't what it needs to be, that's fine. Let's have a conversation of what the new thing needs to be in order to allow, because as Joelle said, the one thing that's really the biggest challenge, I think, in addressing what my public health professors would always call wicked problems, right? So wicked problems are problems you, you make progress here and it creates another problem here. The only way we're going to make progress is if we co-create solutions and we test and we pilot and we figure out what works. And that's in inherently innovative. It, it requires flexibility. It requires resources in order to fail forward. And right now, from a policymaking perspective, it's very difficult outside of local government to see how, under the current environment, we're going to have a lot of flexibility or opportunity. 
I, I just want to add to that. Um, Steve mentioned it. We've all talked about it. Now we have a word. We are a country, a nation that loves taglines, right? So we talked about the Alice family, but they were invisible. Now those families have a name. So when we have a name in this nation, then we start to move and do things like uh, and said. You know, we, we can put a name on this, and we can definitely say within our families, within our circles, who are my Alice friends or who are my Alice family members? And from that perspective, we can move forward. Uh, it was easy to hide, hide these families under policy because we didn't have anything to, to, to call them. We said the decline, of the, middle, the decline of the middle class, and we want to rebuild the middle class. No one talks about poverty because poverty was just too hard, right? That's just too hard to deal with. So policymakers just stick with the middle class. The middle class is declining. Now we can talk about Alice. Alice is here. Alice has a name, and we can begin to deal with that. And we've talked about the, the, the invisibility of some of the Alice uh, folks, um, and, and that is a term that is used in the, in the report and other, and other uh, uh, pieces. Uh, I prefer to think that they've just been overlooked, because uh, they're not invisible. You see them every day. They repair your car. They serve your, your food here today. Uh, they take care of mom at the rest home. Uh, these these are the folks that you interact with these folks every single day and you may overlook them but they're there and they are contributing members of our society and they uh, they need to be recognized for their willingness to work and get up every day and go through it again and again and again with the hope that it will be better but we've got to do right by them okay Next question. Yes, um, I'm, <laughs> thank you for clapping for me. Um, I'm Jane Scott, and um, in our role in the Metropolitan Club, we hear a lot of these conversations, and one of the things that always intrigues me, and please don't, I don't mean this to be disrespectful, it's probably naive, but it seems like some of the things that are missing are connective tissue, that we have one group that talks about we need training these folks are working three, three jobs, so that says to me that maybe the jobs they're working are low-skilled jobs. We need housing. How do, you, how do you go about connecting some of these needs? People who need training could be trained to build their own home. People who um, need transportation could possibly be turned into a driving cooperative to share. People that are paying $1,400 for childcare could potentially get the neighborhood together and create their own care. I, I mean, just wondering, are there ways to provide the organization and the connective tissue to help these folks create some solutions that they own that might ultimately be the answers? So I think your instinct is right on from the standpoint of, and I, that's where I was getting at a little bit with the co-creation and innovative models and trying to sort of figure out what works. Um, certainly a lot of those examples you gave, and this is where government sometimes gets in the way, there's a lot of red tape to doing some of those things, but not always, and, and not always something that can't be overcome. But, but I think that um, you, the larger point you raise, I think, if I'm hearing you, which is something that we're trying to tackle in Summit County and in Akron is you know, we have a community that's resource rich and coordination poor. And so how do you move from, you know, the 50 some nonprofits all going, talk about competition, all going for a limited amount of dollars. And in many cases they overlap in terms of their mission and, and what they're trying to do. But on the other hand, the need is so great, you kind of need all of them, otherwise you wouldn't be able to be doing as well as you were. So I can tell you that in, in, um, in Summit County, and I really have to give uh, 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 Jim Mullen, who's our executive director for Summit County United Way is here and has spearheaded this, of really taking a look at how do we create uh, goals and objectives that tie a lot of these things together so that they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. But, and siloed, but rather if we know if we do well with one, it feeds to the next one, which also feeds so they all help each other. Um, it's really difficult, and I will tell you, and he can articulate it better than I, the initial response to that 
is not always good. In fact, it's typically negative. People sense the loss. They sense, oh my gosh, you know, I've always been doing it this way. I, this is my niche in the community. But I, I, I think that's, you know, we talked about not really having solutions, but I think that's probably where the solutions are going to be found, is when we get it right from a multi-jurisdictional, multi-dimensional way to say it's not just transportation, but it's transportation, housing, and where the job is located, and figuring all that out somewhere within there are probably the progress. Yeah. Th that is the, the role we're seeing more and more United Ways play uh, through what we call community impact or collaborative impact, where we're looking at the needs of a community, uh, doing these assessments, and then asking the social service agencies to meet those needs as opposed to just trying to fund social service agencies. If we're turning it upside down, that's been going on for some time, and it's an important piece of what's going on with the United Way. I want to do one more shameless plug, if I could. Uh, this is, uh, I think many of you are probably uh, interested in, obviously, uh, reviewing the Alice report, and it, as noted on this piece of paper, you can uh, access it at ouworg slash Alice. Uh, it's a, well over a 200-page report. All 88 counties have their individual reports. You can look at your county, you look compared to other counties. Uh, it shows the methodology up front, number of tables, and uh, summaries in there for your, re your review. So please access it there. Great. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that shameless plug <laughs> and for a great panel discussion. Uh, you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, on WOSU and its PBS affiliates statewide, and through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our speakers, James Hardy, Joel Thomas-Jones, Stephen C. Holland, and Joe Ingalls, and thanks to all of you for being here, and we hope to see you again soon.